one of the most celebrated figures in all of ancient history was a student of the philosopher Aristotle. This student, who, uh, whose dad was named King Philip of Macedon, was, uh, was a king in the, in the uh, ancient world. Now, do any of you know who uh, King Philip of Macedon's son, the student of Aristotle, was? Anybody know his name? His name was Alexander the Great. Alexander the Great. What an interesting name. Throughout history, he has come to be known as Alexander the Great. And why? This guy who was a student of Aristotle grew up and he became the king when he was 20 years old. And he died when he was 32. Only had a 12-year reign. He died as a young man. But under Alexander's leadership, the Greek culture, the Greek world flourished. He conquered as a, as a conquering king, he conquered much of the ancient world. The area around the Mediterranean that we uh, know today he was all under Alexander's influence. In fact, there was a movement called Hellenism, which is the spread of Greek culture, Greek language, Greek philosophy, Greek religion. All of that started under Alexander the Great. He had a tremendous influence. In fact, the reason why our New Testament is written in Greek is largely because of the success of Alexander. But Alexander wasn't the only great king in the ancient world. In fact, the Bible tells us 400 years, excuse me, 700 years before Alexander, there was another king, a king by the name of David. And it's for the next couple of weeks that I want to explore David's life with you this morning. And I'm doing so under the title, Shepherd, Warrior, Poet, and King, because it might be true to say that David was not only a great person, he was a great shepherd. Uh, David was a great warrior, to be sure. Uh, David was a great poet and penned much of the uh, Psalms that we have here in our Bible today. And David was, in fact, the greatest king of Israel, human king, I should say, prior to his son, Jesus, who is the great king overall. And so I want to look at David's life with you for the next couple of weeks. Now, David's influence was phenomenal. In fact, uh, the borders of Israel were never as large as they were under King David. I put up a map here. You can kind of see the spread of David's influence. That area in purple in the middle is how large the nation was under King Saul. Uh, It spread to the area that is green under King David, including all that is pink there. And so the borders of Israel were never as large as they were during David's day. Uh, All the way south Uh, throughout the uh, Negev desert, almost down to Egypt, north into modern day Syria, over across the the sea into what is Moab and Ammon, all these different places. He was the great king of Israel and his influence was phenomenal. If you could take um, the concept of a Mount Rushmore and say, who are the four greatest figures of the Old Testament? I think David would have to be on Mount Rushmore. Uh, I would also, by the way, if if you're asking, since no one raised their hand, I'll tell you. um, Thank you. Abraham is the other one. Moses is another one. And Elijah, in my mind, uh, those three plus David would be the Mount Rushmore of the Old Testament. These are some of the key figures. Now, obviously, that could be debated, and uh, and you'd be wrong if you told me it was different than that. But... um, (laughs) But those, that, that's how I see it. That's how I see the Old Testament. These four figures, Abraham and Moses, King David, and the prophet Elijah as being these important, important figures of the Old Testament. David's influence is significant. He was an extraordinarily gifted human being. The goal of this series for the next couple of weeks is not, though, to celebrate the life of David. Um, There's much that can be learned from David's life, but I don't want to just say, okay, we're going to look at David and Goliath, and we're going to learn lessons about, you know, what it looks like to face your giants. I, I don't want to just do that. Rather, what I want to do is use David as a springboard to help us get to the greatest king, King Jesus, okay? So we're going to use David as a springboard, and we're going to look at these different areas of his life to help us understand more about King Jesus, 
Because Jesus says this in the New Testament, by the way, in Luke 24. It's really a fascinating conversation. After his resurrection, Jesus is walking along a road along with some of his disciples who don't recognize him because they think that he's dead. And as he's walking along, they're asked, he asks them, what are you guys talking about? And they say, we're wrestling with this concept of Messiah, this one Jesus. We thought he was the one and he died. And, and then it says Jesus opened his mind, opened their mind and opened their eyes to see and understand how all of the Old Testament was fulfilled concerning him. Every story of the Old Testament, Jesus says, finds its purpose in me. So when you think about David, you need to think about Jesus. When you think about Daniel, you need to think about Jesus. When you think about sacrifice, you need to think about Jesus. This is, by the way, what the author of Hebrews did, right? Everything in the Old Testament is greater when you understand it in light of Jesus. Jesus is the greater version of everything that the Old Testament has to say. That's what Hebrews is all about. That's what Jesus declares about himself. That's what I want to do in this series. I want to allow the Old Testament character of David to help us see and worship Jesus. I don't want to see and worship David. I want to learn from David in order to get to Jesus. Because that's where we need to end up, always, at the feet of Jesus. Amen? worshiping him, understanding him, learning more about him. So to do that, I need to take you on a little bit of a history journey to understand the context of where this story, where this character finds himself in our Old Testament. Now, if you've been around Redwood Chapel a long time and you've listened to my preaching, you know that I love history. And so usually when I begin these kind of journeys in history, I start at the very beginning in Genesis. I'm not going to do that this morning. I'm going to start at the Exodus. Okay, I know, I know, it's, it's a step for me. But the Exodus, I already mentioned Moses. Moses leads the people out of Egypt into the wilderness and there in the wilderness, God connects with the people of Israel. They start as a family, they become a nation and they leads them out into the wilderness and there God becomes the covenant God of the people of Israel. As they make their way towards the land of promise, the land that was promised all the way back in Genesis chapter 12, Genesis chapter 17, it was all promised to Abraham, and yet it's not fulfilled until this guy by the name of Joshua actually leads the people into the promised land. You remember the story? We preached about this a number of years ago. Joshua leading the people of Israel into the promised land. There... By the way, there is a cycle of all this kind of sin and, and a rebellion amongst the people. And God raises up judges by which he connects the people back to himself. Now, I don't know about you, but it's true in my life that there are seasons when I am walking more closely with the Father and seasons when I am walking in sinful rebellion from the Father. Can I get an amen from anyone else in the room? You understand what I'm talking about? There's times when you feel connected to the Lord and you're walking closely with him, and there's times when you feel distant from him and far from him. The book of Judges in the Old Testament is story after story of this cycle of people turning to the Lord in worship and then falling from him and going their own way and doing what is right in their own mind. That's the key line in the book of Judges. Everyone did what was right in their own mind. And God raises up another judge and that judge comes in and tells the people, you gotta turn back to God. And then there's a big repentance and they do the whole cycle over and over and over again. Finally, as they get to the end of the book of Judges, the last judge who's mentioned is a guy by the name of Samuel. Samuel's also, also named as a prophet, but, uh, but he's listed as the last one to judge. Actually, I take that back. He's not listed as the last judge because what we read in 2 Samuel, excuse me, 1 Samuel chapter 8 is that there is a, um, that Samuel says to his two sons, uh, you guys are now going to be the judges of Israel, and these guys are wicked. These guys are disobedient. In fact, if you have your Bible and you haven't yet turned in, in your Bible, turn to 1 Samuel chapter 8. 1 Samuel chapter 8, it says, When Samuel became old, he made his sons judges over Israel. And then it names his sons. Joel was the name of one of them. Abijah was the other one. They were judges in Beersheba. And yet it says his sons did not walk in his ways, but they turned aside after gain. They took bribes and they perverted justice. So Samuel names his two sons to be the next judge after him. And the people of Israel say, hold on a second. These two were wicked. 
These two are messed up. These two are perverting justice. We don't want them to be our judges. In fact, Samuel, here's what we want. We want a king. We want a king like everybody else. We feel left out because we don't have a king like all those other nations. And so God relents and he allows them to have a king. By the way, the fact that other people have it is not a good reason why you should want it. Okay, that's true in all of life. But it's especially true when God is trying to lead his people in a particular way. And they say, well, we like, you know, the Philistines, they've got a king. We want, to be, we want someone like that. The, the Amalekites, they've got a king. Why can't we have a king? We want a king. Hello? God has been the one who has led you to where you are. He has been the one who has provided for you every turn. Why would you want a king when you have God leading the way? Why would you look to a human authority? And yet God relents. And he raises up a king by the name of Saul. Now, Saul is the first king of Israel. Saul looked the part. Um, if, you, uh, if you saw Saul walk into the room and we were like looking around and going, who should be king here? Richard Lee? Eh. You know, Pete Latona? Eh. Not sure. Saul. Yes, Saul. Saul looks like a king. In fact, look what it says in 1 Samuel chapter 9, verse 2. No offense, Richard, Peter, love you both. 1 Samuel chapter 9, verse 2, it says, and he, say, and he had a son whose name was Saul. Saul was a handsome young man. There was not a man among the people of Israel more handsome than he. From his shoulders upward, he was taller than any of the people. Man, this is a guy worth looking at. This is a guy who got people's attention. Saul walks in the room and everyone goes, that should probably be the king right there. If we're going to have one, let's make it Saul. In fact, it says that his father was rich. He comes from good heritage. But here's the thing. In a king, God was looking for someone who would lead his people, someone who would protect his people. But more importantly, he was looking for a king who would represent his own heart to the people. God wanted a person who would represent his heart to the people. He wanted the people to never lose sight of the fact that he was their God. And if, they, if he wanted to raise up a human person to do it, then it needed to be a king whose heart was for the Lord by obedience. And it's Saul's disobedience that gets him in trouble. If you read second, first, I keep saying second Samuel, excuse me. If you read first Samuel chapter 15, you read about Saul's disobedience. The fact that he rebels against God. The fact that he does not obey the commands of God. In fact, there's two specific ways when he is fighting against the Amalekites that provokes a crisis in the land because he goes in and he conquers the Amalekites, but he keeps some spoils for himself. And then he makes a sacrifice that he is not authorized to make. And Samuel comes to him in 1 Samuel chapter 15. And in verse 22, he says, Has the Lord as great delight in burnt offerings and sacrifices as in obeying the voice of the Lord? Behold, to obey is better than sacrifice and to listen than the fat of rams for rebellion is as the sin of divination and presumption is as iniquity and idolatry. Because you have rejected the word of the Lord, he has also rejected you from being the king. This one who looks the part, does not act the part, and as a result of his disobedience, Samuel declares to Saul, the Lord has rejected you as king. And look how chapter 15 closes with verse 35. It says, and Samuel did not see Saul again until the day of his death. But Samuel grieved over Saul. And the Lord regretted that he had made Saul king over Israel. Not a good start to the monarchy in Israel. We want a king. All right, go find yourself a king. Well, we want that one. He's the best looking, sharpest, tallest, strongest from the richest family around. All right, we'll make him king. He raises up. He's disobedient to God. The Lord rejects that decision. The Lord, re the Lord rejects Saul as king. And Samuel grieves this. 
In fact, in chapter 16, verse 1, as Liz was beginning to read, it said, The Lord said to Samuel, how long are you going to grieve over Saul? Apparently, his grief is enduring. Samuel wanted Saul to succeed, I believe. Samuel wanted him to be the king. Do you remember who Samuel's mom was in Old Testament history? Samuel's mom was named Hannah. We read about her in 1 Samuel chapter 1. In in 1 Samuel chapter 1, Hannah, this great woman of faith who desperately loved the Lord and wanted to honor him, also wanted a child, but she found herself to be barren. And she comes before the Lord, she comes before the temple, and she asks the Lord to give her a child. And the Lord grants the desire of her heart, and born to her is Samuel. And she dedicates Samuel to the Lord's work. In fact, if you read 1 Samuel chapter 2, you'll read a prayer from Hannah. That actually is kind of like a prophecy. It's it's a declaration about um, who this one is who is to come. And if you read uh, Hannah's prayer in 1 Samuel chapter 2, it very much has the same kind of echo as Mary's prayer in the New Testament when Jesus is born. This one who is to come. And, and, and the way that Hannah's prayer ends, it's on the screen there. At the end of verse 10, she says these words, The Lord will raise up a judge, or the judge will, excuse me, the Lord will judge the ends of the earth, and he will give strength to his king, and he will exalt the horn of his anointed. Now, why is this a significant, I call, I say, prophetic prayer from Hannah? Because Israel didn't have a king. (laughs) Israel didn't have a king when Hannah praised this prayer. How is he going to give strength to his king? How is he going to exalt the horn of his anointed one when nobody has been anointed to be the king? In fact, that word anointed in the original language is the word Messiah. Exalt the horn of his Messiah. The Greek translation of the Old Testament would translate that word Christos or Christ. He will give strength to his king. He will exalt the horn of his Messiah, his his Christ. Hannah's prayer is a prophetic prayer, not just for what is to come in Israel, but her prayer is a prophetic prayer for what is to come through the person of Jesus. And I believe that as Samuel was coming up in Hannah's household, she may have been telling him, hey, be on the lookout. As the Lord's prophet, be on the lookout for this anointed one. I had this prayer when you were little I, and I prayed and, and the Lord showed me a picture of this king who's to be anointed and this one who is to come this Messiah that we should be looking for and so when Samuel anoints Saul might it have been oh this is the one this is the anticipation this is what I was waiting for this is who we were looking for but Saul disobeys and the Lord says I reject Saul as king and Samuel grieves Wait, God, I thought this was the answer. I thought this was the path. Have you ever been there? Have you ever thought you were on the right path and it turned out to not be the right path? Man, that brings some hard steps. That's some grief you got to walk through. I think that's where Samuel's at. He's, he's realizing that the plan of God may be different than what he thought it was. And so we read... How long are you going to grieve over Saul? Verse 1, chapter 16. Since I have rejected him from being the king over Israel. Fill up that horn with oil and go. I will send you to Jesse, the Bethlehemite. For I have provided for myself a king among his sons. Samuel, don't worry. Yes, I have rejected Saul as king. But I have my eye on another one. I have my eye on someone who you don't know about yet. And so, go to Bethlehem and find him. Man, Bethlehem, that rings a bell, doesn't it? (laughs) Wow, go to Bethlehem. Go to the city whose name means the house of bread. You remember where we first heard about Bethlehem in the Old Testament? It's from Ruth. Ruth. And Boaz and Naomi, who in the midst of a famine, this Moabitess woman 
comes into the area and Boaz redeems this one, Ruth. And by redeeming her, in the midst of a famine, new life is given, new bread is given. And it says in the Bible that Ruth and Boaz have a son whose name is Obed. Obed has a son whose name is Jesse. And Jesse has a son whose name is David. Ruth and Boaz are the great-grandparents of King David. And so it's from this town of Bethlehem where God says to Samuel, I want you to go, I want you to find Jesse. I want you to find my anointed there. And so verses 2 through 5, Samuel says, "Um, how can I go? Because if Saul hears about that, he's going to kill me, (laughs) which is a real practical problem. Saul is still the king, God. I know you've rejected him, but the people don't know that yet, and he's still sitting on the throne. And if he gets wind of the fact that I'm going to go to Bethlehem and I'm going to anoint someone else to be the king, that's going to be the end for me. And it's probably going to be the end for Jesse and all of his family as well. God, are you sure that's a good plan? And the Lord says, take a heifer with you and say, I've come to make a sacrifice to the Lord and then invite Jesse to the sacrifice and then I'll show you what to do for you shall anoint for me him who I declare to you. Samuel did what the Lord commanded and he came to Bethlehem and the elders of the city came out to meet him and they were trembling. Why would the elders of the city of Bethlehem be trembling when Samuel comes? Because Samuel was a judge. And, and, and they know that when the judge shows up, it's usually not good. <laughs> and so they ask him, do you come peaceably? Like, are we okay here? Are you going to rain down something on us? Or is there something we need to repent from? Do you come peaceably? And Samuel says, peaceably. I have come to sacrifice to the Lord. So consecrate yourselves and come with me to the sacrifice. And he consecrated Jesse and his sons and he invited them to the sacrifice. Saul, if he would have heard about what Samuel was up to, he would have likely killed Samuel. He would have likely killed Jesse. He would have likely killed Jesse's sons. God says to Samuel, I need you to go anyway. I need you to make a sacrifice. I need you to consecrate. That means prepare the people for something. Get cleaned up. Get washed up. Uh, Consecrate is the same idea that that we try to implement on a weekly basis here when we take the Lord's Supper. Prepare your heart to receive something from the Lord, right? There is a preparation process that all of us have to go through when we come to church. And and maybe we neglect that sometimes. Maybe we just get up in the morning, get dressed and come. But really we should be preparing ourselves, preparing our heart to hear, God, what do you want to say to me today? What do you want to reveal to me today? How are you calling me to live? How do I consecrate myself? How do I prepare to meet God? Is there a change that you need to make in your Sunday preparation? Is there a change that you need to make in, your, in the way in which you come before the Lord? I, don't, I come too casually, admittedly, at times. I come unthinkingly. I come without preparation. And yet, consecrate yourself. Prepare to meet the Lord. And so they come, verse 6. When they came... Samuel looked at Eliab and he thought, surely the Lord's anointed is before me. Now, why would he think that? Because he's still got Saul syndrome going on in his head, right? Saul syndrome is that guy looks good. That must be him. He's taller than all the other brothers. He's stronger than all the other brothers. It must be Eliab. He's the oldest. Sweet. We found him. God, do your thing. Surely the Lord's anointed is before him. The Lord says to Samuel, do not look on his appearance or on the height of his stature because I've rejected him. For the Lord sees not as man sees. Man looks on the outward appearance, but the Lord looks on the heart. Underline, circle, star, highlights. Don't look at his outward appearance. Man, do we have a problem in our society of making a judgment of people by what we see? I mean, we do. 
We do. We make a judgment, people, based on what we see. And we think that we can identify, oh, that person, look at the way that they're dressed. Look at the ink on their arm. Look at the number of holes in their ears. Look at the colors on their head. Look at all the different things. And we make a judgment on somebody based upon what we see. Don't tell me you don't. Don't lie to me. Don't lie to him. You do. I do. We make a judgment. The Lord doesn't see the outside is what what this text is saying to us. Do not look at his appearance on his height or stature because I rejected him. For the Lord does not look the same way man looks. The Lord does not see the same way that man sees. Man, man, Samuel, you should know this because you were wooed by Saul. You should know not to fall into this trap. But here you go again. The Lord looks at the heart. Of course, that word heart doesn't necessarily mean the organ inside of your chest that's beating and pumping blood around your body. That word is referring more to the inner man, um, the, the place of moral character, the soul of a person. The Lord looks at that. That's what is interesting to him. Not, not, not the shine, not the haircut, not the clothes, um, not, not the contract, not the, not the success, not the position, not the title. His heart, her heart, the thing that no one else sees, that's what's interesting to the Lord. And so Eliab is rejected. And so Jesse says, door number two. <laughs> Let's get son number two, Abinadab out here. Made him pass before Samuel. And he said, the Lord hasn't chosen this one. All right, Shema, come here. Third son. Jesse made Shema pass by. And he said, neither has the Lord chosen this one. And then there's four other guys who aren't even named in the story. What about him? Nope. What about him? Nope. What about him? Nope. What about him? Nope. Seven times. Numbers matter in the Bible. They do. I'm not a numerologist, but numbers matter in the Bible. Seven is the number of completion. Is this everybody? Is this this all you got? This this is the complete list? This This is everybody? It's not Eliab, it's not Abinadab, it's not Shema, it's not the four other sons. No, 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 and no. And so in verse 11, Samuel says, are all your sons here? Is this everybody? Is this the complete list? Well, no. He said, there remains the youngest, but he's out doing his chores. He's not even... Like when you said, get all your sons, I didn't even, I didn't even call him. He's, he's taking care of the sheep. When you, when you let me know, Samuel, that you were going to anoint a new king, I didn't even think of him. I thought of number one, because he's tall and strong. You said, no, I brought in, you, you understand the thing here, Samuel, I brought you seven of them. And you said no to all of them. Samuel must be going, God, you said that the king was going to be anointed here. Jesse must be going, what's wrong with my boys? I thought this was a promise. And God says, there's got to be something else here, someone else. Now, my guess is, is that David, the one shepherd who was out in the field, was not called in because of his age. Most historians think that David was 10 years old at this point in his life. 10, no older than 15, almost guaranteed, but probably 10. That Josephus, the Jewish historian, dates him at 10 years old. You're you're looking for a king. I'm giving you some men here. He's not even a man. He's just a boy. there's, There's nothing impressive about him. He's just taking care of the sheep. I mean, we sent our 10 year olds out of the room. Maybe we should bring him back. (laughs) 
start looking for the character of God in these young men. Amen? Start calling it out. Start seeing. There's, I don't look at your outside. I'm looking at your heart. What's God doing in there? What's he shaping? How's he working? What's he developing? He's out keeping sheep. Samuel said to Jesse, go get him. We're not going to sit down until he comes in. Man, you could have bet the seven older brothers are probably frustrated about this. <laughs> wait, wait, I'm sorry, what? It wasn't him? Not me? Not, not, not us? You want to go get David? We've heard this kind of story before, right? You remember Joseph and his brothers? <laughs> they don't like him either. It's got to be the old one, got to be the strong one, got to be the one with the title. No, no, it's that one, the one that you're not looking at. That's the one that God's looking at. The one that you don't even see, that's the one who God sees. He sent him and he brought him in. It says he was ruddy, hard to translate what that means. Hebrew red, red hair, maybe, I don't know. Beautiful eyes, handsome, young man. The Lord says, that's him. Anoint him. This is the one. This 10-year-old boy, that's the one. I want you to anoint him to be the next king of Israel. He's not going to be king immediately, but he's going to be the next king of Israel. And so it says in verse 13, Samuel took the horn of oil and he anointed him in the midst of his brothers. And the spirit of the Lord rushed upon David from that day forward. And Samuel rose and he went back to his hometown in Ramah. As a 10-year-old boy, after being anointed by Samuel, the spirit of God rushed in on his life for the rest of his life. Now, what is true of David in the Old Testament is true for all of us who are in Christ Jesus today. In that, the spirit of the living God falls on us at the point of our salvation. Yet for the Old Testament character, this was not an everyday occurrence. Not every person had the spirit of God in this way. David, recognizing the reality of the spirit of God in his life, steps into this role, not understanding what all that's going to mean. David and Goliath, that story hasn't even come yet. David and Jonathan, that story hasn't come yet. David conquering other nations, that hasn't come yet. David and Bathsheba, that hasn't come yet. All of these things are yet in the future, and yet the spirit of the living God as a 10-year-old comes into this boy's life. So much, though, that at the point of his sin with Bathsheba, when he sits down and he writes Psalm 51, he writes in verse 11 of Psalm 51, "'Cast me not away from thy spirit, O God. Take not your Holy Spirit from me.'" I believe that David was acutely aware of the fact that the Holy Spirit was the one who was, in, who was in charge of his life, who was ruling his life. And yes, he made a lot of mistakes in his life. That's why we don't emulate David. We look through David to the one who is to come. Because there is also one who from the line of David, a thousand years later, has an anointing of the Holy Spirit. Listen to what it says in Matthew chapter 3. Verses 16 and 17, when Jesus was baptized, immediately he went up from the water and behold, the heavens were open to him and he saw the spirit of God descending on him like a dove coming to rest on him. And behold, a voice from heaven said, this is my beloved son with whom I am well pleased. David's greater son, the descendant of David, also receives the Holy Spirit at the point of his baptism, whereby the Spirit rests on him and anoints him as the Messiah to come, as the one who was promised. And Jesus is the one who takes the message of God most clearly and most perfectly to humanity, to a people who desperately need him, to you and to me. Jesus has come. Jesus, the king, has come. The descendant of King David has come, and he's anointed as Messiah and king. And he was acutely aware of that. For in Luke chapter 4, and when he comes to Nazareth, and he goes to the synagogue, and he teaches, and he says, uh, the place where he'd been brought up, and as was his custom, he went to the synagogue on the Sabbath day, and he stands up to read. And the scroll of Isaiah is handed to him, and he unrolls the scroll, and he found the place where it's written, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me. The same Spirit that came on David 
is the same spirit that has come on me, and he has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor, sent me to proclaim liberty to the captives, the recovery of sight to the blind, set at liberty those who are oppressed, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. And he rolls up the scroll and he sits down and he says, today this has been fulfilled in your hearing. This one who you have been anticipating is here. I'm here in front of you. Hannah prayed about me. David's kingdom is about me. The cycle of sin where you kept needing judges, those judges were representative of me. I am the sacrifice. I am the promise. I am the law. All of the Old Testament, it's pointing to me, and I'm here to give you life. Amen? Anyone here who is in Christ has received this life. The old has passed away, and behold, he's making all things new. It's changing you, restoring you, renewing you, fixing you, healing you, touching you. When you are broken, he's putting you back together. He's bringing something new because he's the Messiah and he loves you. And he's the one who we've been looking for. The shepherd who became king is followed by a descendant king who is later anointed as the great shepherd. It comes full circle. Jesus is known as the great shepherd of the sheep, bringing the flock of God safely home. David's life points to Jesus. David's life points to Jesus. Trust him today. Trust him as your king. Trust him as your shepherd. He is the promised one. As we leave here this morning and begin to think about communion and taking the Lord's Supper, I have a question for you. And the question is, am I a person after God's own heart? Could that be said of me? Am I a person after God's heart? Am I pursuing him? Am I longing for him? When he sees me, when the Father sees me, does he see someone who is bearing his name well? Does my heart reflect his? Am I the person that he wants me to be? Over the next couple of weeks, we're going to continue to unpack this man's life. And as we do, we're going to land on Jesus every week. Because he is the one who ultimately matters. He is our great shepherd. Heavenly Father, as we turn our attention to you through the Lord's Supper, we ask, God, that we would remember the sacrifice of your son in this time. That, yes, he is the Messiah, and that, yes, he is the one who brings about the new heaven and the new earth, who brings about a new kingdom. And so, Father, we eat and drink to remember and we eat and drink to proclaim. We are not like the world. The world drinks to forget. We drink to remember Jesus. Amen. We drink to proclaim Jesus. So Father, may this communion time be a place of unity, be a place of restoration, be a place of healing, as we come to the great shepherd today. In Jesus' name, amen.